Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study. In this session, we're going to continue our critical examination of some of the primary verses and passages and arguments that are most often employed and used by the pre-tribulational camp. And as I said, we're going to look at them critically to demonstrate that not only do they not teach a pre-tribulational rapture, but actually in most cases, they actually point in just the opposite direction. Okay, so in this session, we're going to look at the argument that's often made that at the beginning of chapter 4 of chapter four of Revelation, when John the Apostle is called up and caught up to heaven in the Spirit, where he is then shown the things that will take place thereafter, the argument that's essentially often made, it's really a twofold argument. Pre-tribbers will say, first of all, John here represents the church. And by being caught up to heaven, this is a picture of the rapture, that we should understand this as representing the church that will be caught up to heaven at the pre-tribulational rapture. So that's the first part of the argument. And then the second part of the argument is that after, after chapters 2 and 3, you don't see the word church in Greek. It's ekklesia. You don't see that word again until chapter 22 of Revelation. Therefore, the argument is made that the church must not be present Okay, because the word church is not used, there's many other words that are used, by the way, but we'll get to that. But because the word church is not used, therefore, we can logically conclude that the church is not present. Okay, I'm going to play a little clip here from our brother, Pastor Mark Hitchcock. Um, Pastor Hitchcock is pastor down in Oklahoma. Um, He's one of the more thoughtful, educated, articulate, and fair Um, communicators with regard to the pre-tribulational rapture. So I'm going to play a little clip from Pastor Hitchcock. Um, Also, in the book of Revelation, you have the the word church used 20 times in the book. It's used 19 times in the first three chapters, and we don't see the church again until Revelation 19 as a bride in heaven with Jesus. And then actually the word church isn't used again until Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. So the church is gone from uh, Revelation chapter 4 through 18, which gives us an indication that the church has been caught up to the Lord. So you can see there, he essentially articulates, because the word church is not present, therefore he concludes that the church has been caught up to heaven. Okay, so that's really the crux of the argument. Now, first of all, let me just begin by saying, and this is with all due respect, Not only is this a really, really weak argument, as I'll tease out here, but it's also a very strange argument. It's a very strange argument. In fact, if you really look at what Pastor Hitchcock just said, he says the word church appears 20 times in the book of Revelation. It's used 19 times in chapters 2 and 3. And then he says the church does not appear again until chapter 19 where you see references to the bride. But again, there it doesn't use the word church, it says bride. So he'll say, well, we know the bride is the church, so this is where the church appears again. The problem is, as we'll see, the church is mentioned many, many times throughout the book of Revelation. It simply doesn't use the word church. You have other references like bride, like God's people, those who follow the commandments of Jesus, the saints, etc., etc. So it's a very, it's a very strange argument. It does not logically follow that because the word church is not used, thus the church is not present, again, because there are many other names, titles, and expressions that are used to refer to the church. But of course, of course chapters 2 and 3 use the word church many times because those two chapters contain seven letters to seven specific historical churches. So you have... As each of these letters begin, it says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, to the angel of the church at Smyrna, to the angel of the church at Pergamum, to the angel of the church at Thyatira, etc., etc., Philadelphia, Laodicea, right? They are seven letters. Chapters 2 and 3 have seven personal epistles, if you will, letters from Jesus to the churches. And so, yes, it uses the word church many times. But the fact that much of the book of Revelation doesn't use the word church does not logically infer that the church is not present. It simply uses 
different names, as we'll see. Second, if you really look at what's taking place in Revelation 4.1, and actually, let's go ahead and just read the verse. It says, after these things, this is the Apostle John speaking. He says, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here, and I will show you what things must take place after these things. So here's John the Apostle. This voice calls him up to heaven. He says, I'm about to show you the things that are going to take place after these things. So that's, again, it's a, an experience, something that the Apostle John experienced. There's nothing here about the rapture. There's nothing here about the rapture to say, well, this represents the rapture. You go, how do you get that? There's nothing here to infer that John represents the church. Second, he's not raptured. His spirit is caught up to heaven. He is called up to heaven by the spirit, but his body stays on the ground. So it's not a rapture. Like, it's just, it's a, Paul the Apostle experienced this as well. I mean, like, you've got different experiences where people are called up to heaven in the spirit, but that's not a resurrection. That's not a rapture. He was spiritually taken there. Again, immediately in verse 2, he says, I was in the spirit. There's no mention of a rapture. There's no mention of the church. John was called up by the spirit. There's no reason to see here a uh, sort of an analogy or a spiritual picture of the resurrection of the church, of the rapture of the church. Fourth, simply because the word, and this is really the, the main point here, simply because the word church, ekklesia in the Greek, is not used, that does not logically follow that the church is not present. Numerous, numerous other terms for the church is used throughout the book of Revelation. We see saints used multiple times. We see the term, the witnesses of Jesus. We see our brethren. We see God's people, God's servants. We see the bride used many, many times after chapter 4 throughout the book of Revelation. These are all references to Christians. These are references to the saints. These are references to the church. Now, pre-tribbers will say, these are tribulation saints. They're not part of the church. So they're believers, they're followers of Jesus, but somehow because they got saved after a particular point in history, they're not part of the church. And this is, so to understand this, one of the key foundations of the pre-tribulational rapture is what's called dispensationalism. Without dispensationalism, you would not have the doctrine of a pre-tribulational rapture. And in short, what, tri what dispensationalism is, is the idea that history is divided up between various dispensations, different periods. And under each one of these different dispensations, there's a different economy. God is sort of relating to mankind differently. So in the times past, he related to Israel through the law, through the Mosaic Torah. But now he's dealing with the church through grace. And there is a very rigid, okay, dispensationalism holds a very rigid distinction in categorization. You have Israel, you have the church, then you have tribulation saints, you have these different categories. Now, while I would acknowledge as a historical premillennialist, that's the idea that I believe Jesus will return before the millennium. And when I say historical, I say I'm in agreement with the uh, early church, with the early church writers like Irenaeus and Hippolytus, those that were following the teachings of the apostles. So I am a historical premillennialist. I'm not a dispensational premillennialist. I reject dispensationalism. Uh, as the primary filter through which to interpret the Bible. So while I would acknowledge that while the Bible does recognize a difference, if you will, between Israel and the church, the really rigid, rigid distinction that dispensationalism makes takes it way too far. The story of redemption, the plan of salvation, is far more unified than dispensationalism makes it out to be. There's a difference between Israel and the church, but there's also a tremendous amount of overlap, you know, and to, to try to make these very rigid distinctions, no, that God deals with Israel or he deals with the church, 
This is the reason, by the way. Please understand this. This is the logic behind the pre-tribulational rapture. Because dispensationalists hold that God only deals with one group at any given time. He can't deal with Israel and the church at the same time. There's the argument that the Lord had to remove the church from the picture in order that he could return to start dealing with Israel for the final seven years at the end of the age, Allah Daniel 9. Okay, so Daniel 9, the prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks, You have this one final week, this one final seven-year period at the end of time. Dispensationalists will say, that's for Israel. Now, we're going to get into these arguments more. They'll say, that's for Israel and only for Israel. Therefore, the Lord has to remove the church. Thus, they needed a mechanism. They needed to come up with some way to get the church out of the picture. And thus, the pre-tribulational rapture was invented. Okay, so let's be very clear. The pre-tribulational rapture is a necessary component in the storyline to get the church out of the picture so that their system of dispensationalism, which says God only deals with one people at any given time, that he dealt with Israel in the past, then throughout the age of grace he deals with the church, then he's returning to deal with Israel at the final seven years. This very complicated sort of um, time frame, storyline that they lay out, It necessitated a pre-tribulational rapture. But again, it's not taught in the scriptures. They needed to import it. They needed to impose it. They needed to create it. Okay, so forgive me for a little bit of a side ramble. Let me get back here to the issue of Revelation 4. Let's look at a handful of passages throughout Revelation where the church is mentioned, although it doesn't use the word church. Christians are mentioned. Revelation 12, 10 through 11. When Satan is cast out of heaven, it says, the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. So who is Satan accusing? He's accusing those saints that are alive on the earth, and it calls them our brothers and sisters, our brethren. Okay, so you have our brethren are here during the tribulation on the earth, and it says Satan accuses them before God day and night, and they, the brethren, our brothers and sisters, On the ground, on the earth, during the tribulation, it says they will overcome Satan. How? Because of the blood of the Lamb. So they are under the blood of the Lamb. Jesus died for them, just like you and me. And because of the word of their testimony, they held firm. They did not love their lives, even unto death. They were willing to lay down their lives for Jesus, for the gospel, as our brothers and sisters. But pre-tribbers will say, but they're not part of the church. They're part of a different group. And I go, no, I would say they are part of the church. The word ecclesia, by the way, means the congregation. They're part of the congregation. They are our brothers and sisters. They're not part of some other group. This is us. Revelation 12, verse 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman. That's Israel. And he went off to make war with the rest of her children. It refers to Israel's children as those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So again, our brethren on the ground who keep the commandments of God, who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And by the way, what are the commandments of God? Love God, love your neighbor. Like they're very clear. First John lays it out. The word saints is used throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation 5, verse 8. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had harps and golden bowls filled with incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. The saints, our brothers and sisters, the brethren. Revelation 8, 3. Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. Verse 4, the smoke of the incense along with the prayers of the saints. The saints are on the ground praying and crying out, filling up the bowls of incense. These, this represents the prayers of the saints. Revelation 11, verse 18, the nations were angry, but your wrath has come against the nations. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints. 
to those who fear your name. So who are the saints? They're our brethren. There are those who fear the Lord's name. They are those who carry the testimony of Jesus. They are the faithful witnesses of Jesus, the faithful martyrs of Jesus. Revelation 13, verse 7, it says, And the beast, the beast was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. Listen, this is so important. The Lord will give permission to the Antichrist to wage war against our brethren, against the saints, against the witnesses of Jesus. He will be given permission to conquer them, to conquer them. This is such a critical point. You'll often hear, and we're going to touch on this argument later, you'll often hear pre-tribbers teach, God would never allow his bride to be beaten up. He would never allow us to be beaten up. It says here, the Lord will give permission to Satan to conquer our brothers and sisters, to conquer the saints, to conquer these noble ones who carry the name of Jesus, who are willing to lay down their lives for Jesus, okay, something that we should all aspire to, models of the faith, the Lord will allow them to be conquered You can't say to me, the Lord would never allow us to be beaten up, but he would allow them to be beaten up because technically they got saved after a particular date. Like, how in the world does that matter? Are they not purchased by the blood of Jesus? Did Jesus not die for them? Does he not love them? Of course he does. But again, we're going to come back to this issue later. Revelation 13, verse 10. This calls for the endurance and the faithfulness of the saints. These are faithful saints, enduring faithfully till the end. Revelation 17, verse 6, I saw the woman, the harlot. She was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood. Who are the saints? They are the witnesses of Jesus. The word there, witness, by the way, in the Greek is martus. It's from the, it's where we get the word martyr. They are the faithful witnesses, the faithful martyrs. Whether they're alive or dead, they are bearing witness to the world concerning Jesus and who he is. Revelation 19, verse 8, she was given fine linen to wear. This is who? The bride, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Okay, notice the saints here are the bride, which Pastor Hitchcock would say is the church. Throughout the whole book, the saints... He would say, well, those are the tribulation saints. Those are not the bride saints. You know, like these categories, those are not us. And I go, no, these are all part of the same family, the same unit. The saints, the faithful martyrs, that is the bride. They are present during the tribulation, enduring, bearing faithfully, sharing the name of Jesus to a resistant world, laying down their lives if necessary. The reason all of this matters, guys, like, again, people, I just want to constantly come back to this throughout the series. Why does any of this even matter? Because the exhortation to you and me throughout the book of Revelation, what is it for? Like, how does it relate to us? If we're not even going to be here, why even study it? Why? Who cares? Why do we spend so much time in Revelation if we're not going to be here for it? If we're just going to be in heaven enjoying the marriage supper, then who cares? I go, no, it does matter very much because it is given for us. There are exhortations, there are warnings throughout the book of Revelation which are for us, which is what? It goes, guys, this is the church throughout the tribulation. And what are the virtues that they display? What, are the, what, what type of character do they have? Endurance, faithfulness. They have the name of Jesus. They're not ashamed of Jesus. They're willing to die for Jesus. The patient endurance of the saints. This is the call. This is the call of the Lord right now. If you're a pastor, the call on you is to prepare the church to live as faithful witnesses, 
to endure faithfully to the end, to be willing to lay down our lives. This is the cry and the call of the book of Revelation for us. Guys, be ready at any given time, whether you face the great tribulation and the Antichrist or simply an Antichrist and any tribulation as any one of us could at any time in history. I can walk out the door today and face an Antichrist. I could get a call right now and suddenly find myself in the midst of a personal tribulation. We're all Christians to be prepared for these things. But could we together corporately face the final ultimate enemy, the demon? Could we face him? Yes. Are we prepared as a church? Again, many of the leading voices, the pastors, the leaders, the shepherds today are telling the church, don't worry about it. We're out of here anyway. Zoom, we're going to heaven. We'll never see it. Be at ease. You know, like have peace. You will never see these things. And the pre-tribulational teaching robs the church of the most essential cry, the most essential mandate, the most essential exhortation of the book of Revelation, which is to be prepared to lay down our lives not just individually, but together, corporately, for a world that hates us. That's what we're called to do. The pre-tribulational rapture robs the church of this essential exhortation and call. It, it, again, from a pastoral perspective, these things very much matter. They're in the Bible for a reason. It's not just trivia. Oh, that's something that other people will experience. If those poor suckers get saved after this particular date, then they have to face the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan. They have to lay their lives down. But praise God, we don't have to. Like you talk about false privilege. Talk about giving the church a false sense of comfort. This is essentially what the false prophets are rebuked for. Through, I mean, like you read Ezekiel 13, Jeremiah 14. You read the Lord's rebuke to the false prophets, to the false shepherds of Israel. You have said peace, peace, when there is no peace. You've given a false sense of comfort. You haven't proclaimed a message which encourages repentance and the fear of the Lord. No, it's don't worry about it. We're out of here anyway. Everything's going to be okay. That is the essence of a false prophet. Forgive me, I'm, I'm preaching. The fifth problem with the pre-tribulational interpretation is that they are unable to explain the purpose and the reason for the, the, the uh, tribulation saints. Okay, so there's, it's always about, they go, no, you have to understand the final seven years, that's for Israel, it's not for us, so therefore the Lord must remove us. And I go, well, then why are all these tribulation saints there? What's their purpose? Well, they're just there, just incidentally, because they get saved afterwards. I go, but what's their purpose? Well, they're going to be faithful witnesses. I go, so then we could be there as faithful witnesses as well. No, because it's not for us, because we're, we're already under the blood. And I go, but they're under the blood. Why doesn't the Lord just rapture them as soon as they get saved? Well, because they get saved, you know, like it's this circular logic that simply doesn't make sense. I'm going to play a little quote here from Amir Tsafardi, again, very well-known pre-tribulational Bible teacher, where he kind of articulates uh, this particular problem. Then why, why is the rapture? Why can't Jesus just come back and that's it? Well, God loves you so much that he wants you to be taken away before he is going to pour his judgment over this world. That's why. Okay, so you'll often hear this type of sentiment expressed by pre-tribbers or by pre-trib teachers. So again, here's a leading pre-tribulational teacher. He says, why does the Lord remove the church from the earth? Because God loves you so much. He loves you so much that he wants to remove you. And I go, okay, if we follow this logic, if we accept what Amir says, then we have to then say, God doesn't love the tribulation saints. Yes, Jesus died for them, but he doesn't love them. He loves us enough to remove us. But they, on the other hand, they got saved again after a particular date. So therefore, 
His love doesn't extend to them. He's going to let them be mown down to be conquered by the Antichrist. I go, I don't believe that. These are shining examples. They're living as we should live, as faithful witnesses of Jesus. I think Jesus loves them very much. So you can't tell me the reason we're raptured is because he loves us. That simply doesn't work. Second, you have to say, what about Israel? I know that most of Israel isn't saved during the tribulation, that they ultimately get saved when Jesus returns, when they look upon the one they have pierced. But does he not love them? If he removed us because he loves us, you have to say God doesn't love Israel. And this is coming, by the way. Amir Tzafardi is a Messianic Jew who lives in Israel. And he's articulating an argument that logically infers that God doesn't love Israel. Now listen, you go, but they're not believers. So he doesn't love them until they become believers. But he knows that those that survive until his coming, he knows that all Israel will be saved. As Paul the Apostle says in Romans 11, all those who survive, all those who remain at the coming of the Lord, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So you can say, well, they're not believers yet, but they will be, and he knows that. God loves Israel. He loves the church. He loves the tribulation saints. He loves all of us. And yet, he will allow us to be conquered. He'll allow us to be broken in order that we can imitate Jesus, the one who conquered this world. Behold, I have overcome the world, he said. He says, be encouraged, fear not. In this age, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. He overcame the world. How did he overcome it? By being overcome. He overcame the world by laying down his life, and then the Lord raised him back up, right? And we likewise, as his students, as his disciples, as imitators of Jesus. He is our model. We are called to imitate him. We also are called to lay down our lives and to be conquered in order that we, like our master, will also overcome this world. It's through being overcome that we overcome. Look at it. Look at the parallel. Throughout the the paradox, throughout Revelation, the ones who are overcome, he calls them overcomers, the ones who are killed, the, one who, the ones who lose their life, the one that, that Satan is given permission to conquer, they're called overcomers. Guys, the calling on the church today is for you and me to be overcomers. We overcome not by being removed prematurely and avoiding tribulation. We overcome by trusting his spirit to empower us to live as Jesus lived in the midst of trials and tribulations in the time of great testing. So again, I'm going to end it right here. I trust that um, some of these significant problems with one of the foundational pre-tribulational arguments make sense to you. Um, If you disagree, again, just please know that we're brothers and sisters. This is not an issue worth dividing or fighting over, although I would argue, as I have, that it has profound pastoral, practical, pragmatic relevance to all believers. And thus it's worth discussing. It's worth contending over. But again, it's an in-house, in-family discussion. So again, let's not divide. Let's not fight over these things. But let's chew on them together and wrestle through what the Lord would call you and me to embrace and to focus on in these days. So amen and amen. God bless. Look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, Maranatha.